From Wall Street to Main Street, 25 years of business and financial news. 25 years of highs and lows, of triumphs and tragedies. 25 years of successes and failures, and it is always the people who make the biggest difference. Now, a look at the 25 most influential business people of the last 25 years. I'm Paul Kangas. And I'm Susie Garib. This is a special edition of Nightly Business Report, 25 Most Influential. Hello, everyone. Nightly Business Report has been on public television now for 25 years. 25 years as America's most watched daily business and financial news program. So we're looking back at the people who have had the greatest impact over those two and a half decades. From hundreds of nominations from you, our viewers, a panel of professors from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania selected the winners. The criteria were simple. They must have created new and profitable ideas, affected political, civic, or social change in the business or economic world. Created new business opportunities or more fully exploited existing ones, caused or influenced dramatic change in a company or industry, and inspired and transformed their companies, industries, or employees. The winner's list has names you might expect, and some names that might surprise you. So here in alphabetical order are the 25 most influential business people of the last 25 years. Entrepreneur Mary Kay Ash lived her life and ran her company by the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Sticking to that motto, she built one of the largest direct sellers of cosmetics in the world with more than a billion and a half dollars worth of sales. Her ingenious creation of a reward system for the women selling her products started in an era when men ran the workforce. Since then, millions of women worldwide have become empowered by Ash's work ethic and her vision. The company's mission is to enrich women's lives and it supports hundreds of charitable projects worldwide. If you've shopped online in the last few years, chances are you've visited the Amazon. Amazon.com. It's the brainchild of Jeff Bezos, cooked up, so the story goes, during a road trip from New York to Seattle. His business plan for selling over the web has become a virtual blueprint for internet retailing. Amazon.com started life as a book selling site. Now it peddles everything from hard hats to housewares, and in the process, Bezos has become one of the nation's wealthiest people. Our Wharton judges call John Bogle the Henry Ford of the investment industry because he brought reasonably priced investments of high value to the masses. Bogle did it by founding the Vanguard Group back in 1974 and focusing on index funds, a concept that had been around for a long time in the academic world. But Bogle created a whole new business model around it no loads and no sales fees. Then he motivated other money managers to buy into the vision of bringing investment to ordinary Americans. I'm more persuaded than I've ever been before that owning the entire stock market and holding it forever at very, very low cost is the ultimate investment strategy. Uh, for the young viewers, it is the killer app. I think one of the reasons why Jack Bogle is on this list is because he had a tremendous impact on this sort of average person. So many of the other leaders had big impacts on their companies, obviously, and to some extent on their industries, and perhaps on other people in the business community. But Jack Bogle had an impact on the average person, the average investor, which made a big difference in the lives of those people. Bogle is also known for his persistence. He butted heads with the rest of the investment community to get his pioneering ideas into the marketplace. And he's still going strong. Even though he retired from Vanguard in 1999, he continues to be his industry's fiercest and most persistent critic, fighting for the rights of individual investors. He's the most unlikely of billionaires, with a penchant for risky business ideas that almost always make money, lots of it. Richard Branson began the Virgin franchise as a business novice in the late 1960s with a student magazine. Now, more than 200 companies later, the Virgin name is on planes, trains, cellular phone services, music megastores, even a bridal boutique. It's the largest privately held company in Britain with annual revenues of over $5 billion. Branson thrives on the challenge that running such a large company provides, saying he's lived by the dangerous and sometimes rather foolish maxim 
that he's prepared to try anything once. When Warren talks, people listen. Warren Buffett, that is. The Oracle of Omaha is considered the greatest stock investor of modern times. Starting out in 1954 with a nest egg of just $100, he's now one of the richest men in the world. His firm, Berkshire Hathaway, has a market cap of more than $100 billion. It's a holding company with a wide swath of long-term investments, ranging from media to insurance to furniture to candy. We've bought some interesting companies. We've got great managers out there. The businesses generally are doing well, and I'm having more fun than ever. Wharton's Mike Yuseem calls Buffett really a man for all seasons. seasons. He's an investment manager extraordinaire. He came in to run Solomon in the early 90s, proving that he can run a company like everybody else. And number three, he's become a conscience of the street, offering great wisdom on such contentious topics as expensing stock options. So great investment manager, great company manager, and a person of great integrity and character and conscience for Wall Street. With old-fashioned values, a tremendous range of talents, and a gift for telling it like it is, Buffett concedes he has two key rules of business. Rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. It was James Burke who pulled Tylenol off the shelves of the nation's drug stores in 1982 after capsules laced with cyanide were found. That critical choice for Johnson & Johnson and Burke, its chief executive officer, cost the company $100 million. But Burke went on a mission to restore consumers' trust again, relaunching the product in a new tamper-resistant package. And one year later, Tylenol had regained 90% of its market share. The Wharton judges believe Burke's actions and his commitment to serving the public in the best possible way still shine today as an excellent example of management in a crisis. Not many billionaires begin their business by selling computer components from their college dorm room. Michael Dell did. He now runs one of the largest providers of computing products and services in the world and was the youngest ever CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Dell made our 25 most influential list because he revolutionized an industry and a supply chain by cutting out retailers and selling custom ordered computers right to consumers. Dell manages his business in the belief that the status quo isn't good enough, that striving for the next success keeps the company alive and vibrant. For more than half a century, Peter Drucker has educated managers, imbuing them with personal responsibility and business accountability. That's why in 2002, he was presented with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. Drucker was the first college teacher to bear the title Professor of Management back in 1950. Bill Gates has the vision thing. He began writing computer code at age 13 in suburban Seattle, dropped out of Harvard to start a software company named Microsoft, and saw the promise few other people did, that personal computers in the home and workplace were the future. His software products now run 90% of the world's PCs. Most of the great advances in personal computing are driven by people who personally want to use the product that they're creating. Wharton's Bob Middlestadt says that Gates is among the top 25 because Gates changed the way we work and the way his employees work as well. There have been very few successful business people who started as entrepreneurs and managed to run a company all the way up to a very large size. In the last 100 years, much less the last 25, there's only been a few. Somebody like Henry Ford comes to mind. What Gates has done has been to have a vision that has served the company well, evolved over time, but he's also had the ability to bring in a lot of very smart people and let them do their thing in a way that most entrepreneurs are not capable of doing. And our Wharton judges also, also point out that Gates is using his influence and his money to make a social difference in the world today. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has a $24 billion endowment to support global health and learning initiatives. Its immunization programs and internet access programs have brought new hope to communities around the world. For William George, leading with the heart, not just the head, is the key to corporate success. 
That was his credo in his years at Medtronic, the world's leading medical technology company, and it continues today. George believes companies must instill a sense of purpose and passion into their employees no matter what the company does. He calls it authentic leadership, making a difference in the lives of people you serve, both your employees and your customers. Louis Gerstner is credited with engineering one of the most stunning corporate turnarounds in the last 25 years when he rescued IBM from near disaster. From his joining Big Blue in 1993 as chairman and CEO to his retirement in 2002, he transformed a corporate culture, focused on his core customers, and reignited growth. Gerstner is known as a CEO who never promises more than he can deliver, and he retains a sense of humor of sorts about his work. His best-selling book about his time at IBM was entitled, Who Says Elephants Can't Dance? Alan Greenspan is the ultimate market mover, and by many accounts, one of the most powerful men in the world because of his impact on the U.S. economy. A master of number crunching, Greenspan was appointed to lead the Federal Reserve in 1987 and has guided monetary policy through inflation, recession, and more than one stock market crisis. While his comments are closely watched on Wall Street and Main Street, he can be inscrutable in his speeches. He once remarked, if I seem unduly clear to you, you must have misunderstood what I said. Greenspan was awarded an honorary British knighthood last year, recognizing his contribution to global economic stability. For Andy Grove, the unconventional approach put him in the right industry at the right time with, as the Wharton judges put it, the right mindset. Modern computers wouldn't be possible without microprocessors, and Intel wouldn't have been possible without Grove's leadership. If we hadn't developed the 286, the 386, the 486, the Pentium processor, as fast as our little feet could take us, we would be history too. Obsoleting your own product before other people obsolete yours. Grove's resolute nature was shaped as a child in Stalinist Hungary, escaping as a teenager to New York. That experience gave him the determination and drive to make a success in anything he chose. And Intel is what he chose. Rather than making a conventional career choice to join Bell Labs, Grove made an unconventional one, starting up Intel with others and putting his creative stamp on the chip maker. One of those creative strokes from Grove branding the slogan Intel Inside on the computers bearing his chips. That brand can now be found on 80% of computers around the world, and Intel Inside has become the gold standard in the industry. Wharton's Mukul Pandya says there's a key lesson to be learned from Grove's leadership. Don't give up. Uh, I, I think that, uh, and, and turn your weaknesses and setbacks into stepping stones for success. Uh, don't follow the beaten path. Have the courage to think differently and uh, use your antennae to make the right business decisions. And having made them, be resolute in sticking to them until you reach your goal. Uh, I think that uh, he, uh, Grove uh, exemplifies this outlook more than any other business leader of the current times. Grove himself admits his life hasn't taken the beaten path. In his book, Only the Paranoid Survive, there's a chapter he calls, Let Chaos Reign. Only stepping out of the old ruts will bring new insights. No one has changed the face of America's automotive industry in the last 25 years like Lee Iacocca. He's known as the father of the Ford Mustang, one of the most successful models ever. His stint as the president of Chrysler saw him turn around a troubled and virtually bankrupt company by borrowing millions of dollars from the government, then paying back every one of them. Iacocca believes the key to his success is being decisive, that business decisions can be reduced to people, products, and profit. Our Wharton judges agree. Steve Jobs is on the list of the 25 most influential because he built a better mousetrap. Our Wharton panel says he has the ability to see what other people can't, even when it's right under their nose. The technology components that went into the development of the Apple computer all existed for years at Xerox. But it was Jobs who put them together in a new and different way, because he didn't think a computer had to be a big mainframe. And Apple isn't his only plum project. 
Apple's iPod Music Machine, its iTunes online music store, and the films of the Pixar Animation Studio are other examples of Jobs' approach to development, elegant, well-designed products that bring complicated technology to a mass market. We are fundamentally changing the way we do business without losing sight of why we do business. And that is to make the best tools in the world for people who think creatively. As Wharton's Mukul Pandya explains it, Jobs' most remarkable quality is to see the invisible. He qualifies because he has the ability to see what is not apparent to other people. He qualifies because he is a genius at simplifying things in a way that opens up new markets. Uh, he is the kind of influential leader he is because he is a tremendous motivator of people and teams to create tr fantastic products and you see that consistently in his career and finally he is a tremendous uh, leader because of his resilience uh, these four qualities make him what he is and make Apple and Pixar what they are Herb Kelleher had an idea that transformed an industry and made him the soul of Southwest Airlines. It was 1967 when he set out to change the stuffy airline business with a quirky, innovative carrier that broke all the rules. There were low-cost airlines before, but they weren't reliable. Kelleher made sure that Southwest planes arrived on time, departed on time, and made money. He promoted from within, giving his employees opportunities to learn and grow, and gaining their faith with a no layoff policy that endures to this day. Our Wharton judges say he's one of the 25 most influential, not because of what he did, but how he did it. Uh, I think what's important about Herb Kelleher and what he's done at Southwest Airlines is that it wasn't necessarily a new technology or wasn't necessarily so much a new business idea. It was about execution. And it was execution around the way he managed the company and managed the employees. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that presumably you could see being done in more or less any industry and more or less in any company. Still, you rarely see in any industry or company the chairman as cheerleader carrying the culture of Southwest all over the country. And experts say that's a key role Kelleher has also played for Southwest, carrying the culture of the company nationwide. By investing with the concept, buy what you know, Peter Lynch became one of the most successful mutual fund managers in history. He bought stakes in the companies and industries he understood with products and services that held promise, then held them long term, ignoring the ups and downs of the day-to-day -day markets. His strategy paid off for investors in the Fidelity Magellan Fund he took over back in 1977. Putting $10,000 in the fund then would have reaped $288,000 when Lynch retired in 1990. That's an annual average return of 29%. For Charles Schwab, the idea was to create a world of smarter investors. Using $100,000 borrowed from his uncle, Schwab started the first company giving consumers the tools to buy and sell stocks themselves without the help of traditional stockbrokers. It was a radical concept at the time, the mid-1970s. Now, Charles Schwab, the company, is one of the nation's largest brokerage firms and competes with other firms who built on Schwab's low-fee model. It's a phrase heard in businesses around the world, just FedEx it. And it's the result of Frederick Smith's simple idea that became a phenomenon. In 1971, Smith incorporated a small airline into a logistics solution, delivering packages overnight. Transportation is in his blood. Smith's father helped found the Greyhound bus line. His grandfather captained a paddle boat on the Mississippi River. Smith is also a pioneer in using the Internet as a business tool, letting customers track packages themselves over the web. To quote an old phrase, George Soros marches to a different drummer. The billionaire hedge fund operator is best known in business circles as the man who broke the Bank of England by speculating in currencies. But he has morphed from financial genius to policy practitioner to philanthropist. He now uses his network of foundations, spending about a half a billion dollars every year to encourage democracy and economic growth in developing nations. 
They call him the mouth of the South, but Ted Turner puts his money where his mouth is. The brash billionaire from Georgia made his money in media, launching CNN, the world's first all-news cable television operation. But beginning in the mid-1980s, Turner turned to philanthropy. His Turner Foundation gives millions of dollars to environmental causes. His version of the Olympics, the Goodwill Games, was meant to contribute to world peace. And his promised gift of a billion dollars to the United Nations is among the largest single donations ever by a private individual. Sam Walton knew the value of a dollar, and he was determined to provide the best value for the dollars of his customers. The story is almost legend. The folksy down-to-earth merchant started in Arkansas and grew one store into the number one retailer in the world. And he wasn't afraid to walk the walk, or in this case, dance it. In 1984, Walton did the hula on Wall Street after promising employees that if the company had a pre-tax profit of 8% or higher, he would don a grass skirt. Walton didn't invent discounting, but he had the insight to realize it was the future of retailing. The first Walmart opened in 1962, and to this day, the stores still reflect his belief in service to the community as well as the customer. I think Sam Walton's legacy really is that a single individual can make a difference in an industry. It doesn't happen instantly, but over a period of time, his commitment to bringing good value and lower prices to customers and his commitment to his own employees in terms of motiv motivating them to feel good about what they do is something that's uh, unparalleled for a single individual in very in almost any industry, much less in the retail industry. We know his name and it's synonymous with those two things. And his name is known and respected around the world. They call him the patron saint of CEOs. Jack Welsh is a no-nonsense, laser-focused leader who our Wharton judges say could see the future, then make certain his company got there. Welsh joined that company, General Electric, in 1960. By the time he became GE's eighth and youngest chairman and CEO in 1981, the company had a market cap of about $12 billion. When he retired in 2001, GE was one of the world's largest conglomerates with a market cap of about $400 billion. But for Welch, it isn't all about money. Whether it's a success from a, whether it's a, a, a great deal where you learn a lot about yourself, or whether it's a failure where you learn a lot about yourself, the idea of learning all the time is critical. Wharton's Mike Yusim says Welch's contribution is all about leadership. We look at Jack Welsh's style. He has really written the textbook on how you develop great leadership within. He has always said that he does not know how to make jet engines. He does not know what to put on Tuesday night TV, a GE property, NBC television. What he is good at, and he's absolutely right, is identifying leadership potential, putting those people with potential in a position where they can lead, making certain they're quickly gone if they can't, providing support for their further leadership development, and then at the end of the day, what he has is probably one of the best leadership teams in the corporate world, probably anywhere. Welsh's latest success is as an author. His book, Jack, Straight from the Gut, ranked number one on bestseller lists, proving another good thing he brings to life. Oprah Winfrey is a modern media mogul with an empire that includes television, film, magazines, and books. Among the most powerful women in American business today, Winfrey came from humble beginnings and created a powerful brand through hard work and perseverance. In an industry that often finds businesses controlled by others, Winfrey is an exception, keeping hands-on management of her company, Harpo Productions. Our Wharton judges also cite her commitment to community. The Oprah Winfrey Foundation supports the education and well-being of women, children, and families around the world. Mohammed Yunus is proof that small money can lead to big changes. Yunus is the founder of Bangladesh's Grameen Bank, a village bank set up in 1983 to provide micro-credit loans, small amounts of money, to the rural poor in an effort to fight poverty. Grameen now has more than a thousand branches, many in villages like this, and has loaned more than two billion dollars. Experts say Yunus' idea on coupling capitalism and community service have changed the face of rural economic development forever. 
So now the answer to the question, who did the Wharton judges select to top the list of the 25 most influential? Tied for second place, Microsoft's Bill Gates and General Electric's Jack Welch. Susie sat down with Welch to talk to him about his leadership and his legacy. She began by asking him what was the key to his remarkable success at General Electric. Well, I always got great people around me, people who were as smart or smarter than I was. I, um, I loved to have fun, and uh, I let her rip all the time. And we took chances together. And the nice thing about having a big company is you can take a chance and not really screw it up badly. Mr. Welsh, you have been praised for your tremendous skill in developing business leaders. Uh, given all the concern recently about ethics and about improper practices by CEOs, what's your take on the status of America's business leaders? There's no excuse ever for what went on in a few companies, but the vast majority of people and the people that work there, you know, I've talked to over 200,000 people speaking engagements the last couple of years, and, most, and everyone I meet is just you know, that I know is, is hardworking, strong, um, character, trying to get through the day, trying to live a life, trying to do it right. So I just don't see widespread corruption. I mean, there, there are examples of bad actors and bad companies, but very few. Considering all of the changes in corporate governance and the power shifts in the boardroom, if you were CEO today, do you think that you could be as powerful and effective as you were in your years at GE? Look, you're not going to, you're not going to change good companies. Good companies are going to behave the way they always did. Now, there's a few more forms that fell out, but basically, if integrity is in the gut, it's in the fabric of the company. It's going to be there. If it wasn't there, it's not going to. A form isn't going to do it. But if you were CEO, do you think you'd have to modify your leadership style? None. Absolutely none. We know about all of your successes, but what about your mistakes? As you look back, what was your biggest mistake and the biggest lesson you learned from it? If I had to go back, you know, without question, Kidder Peabody was my, it was an investment bank and I, and I bought it. Uh, I had a lot of successes and I was probably too big for my britches and I bought another one. And um, what I learned from that was culture counts. Culture really counts. All the things we were preaching at GE, they didn't believe in it, Kidder. And then, so in the 90s, in the late 90s, I, I had lots of chances to buy Silicon Valley companies. And I didn't want to pollute, I learned I didn't want to pollute the company. Mm -hmm. So I didn't buy them. So I, I don't know if it's a lesson or it was good or bad or we missed some opportunities from that. But it, I learned that culture really counts. After you retired from GE, you were criticized for your retirement and compensation yeah. uh, package. Uh, it was considered excessively lavish, and you made some givebacks. What are your thoughts on that now, and would you have handled that differently? You know, that's an interesting one. It's probably the toughest call I ever had. I'm probably glad I did it because it got GE out of the papers. It was fundamentally wrong for me to do it. People shouldn't give back things because of press and times. You'll never be able, it'll, it'll always have a look of, hey, you gave it back. Probably shouldn't have had it. Well, I never would have given it back in normal times because it wouldn't have come up in normal times. But I, I created the problem with a divorce, with falling in love with somebody else. And so I thought it was my duty to get it off the table. Um, I'll never know the answers to what I should have said, no, this is legal. You have a knack for making the right decisions, making them quickly, and having confidence in them. Is that something that can be taught? No, you learn that. I think, I think you, it's a series of every, every experience builds on another experience. Success, your failures you learn, you just keep building. But they're, they're little incremental things. People say to me, what good's an MBA? I said, I'm not sure the MBA's worth anything other than the fact you got another notch on your belt. You competed with some people, and you got something. That makes you more confident. If you could give one important piece of advice for the new generation of managers, what would that be? Do your thing. I mean, have fun, do what you like. If you're doing something you don't like, get the hell out of it. Go live and do, and do things and reach for, the, reach for the moon all the time. Have fun doing it and uh, don't be afraid. Don't live in a box. How do you want to be remembered five years from now? What do you want people saying about Jack Walsh? That I gave a lot of people room to grow, that uh, people flourished, 
and reached a lot of their dreams. Yeah, I don't really have a lot more than that. And I had a hell of a good time doing it. Mr. Welch, thank you so much. As always, it's a pleasure talking to you. Great talking to you, Susie. Thanks a lot. And the winner is Intel's Andy Grove. The Wharton judges chose him as the most influential business person of the past 25 years. Susie talked with Grove and asked him what he sees as his greatest influence in the past two and a half decades. I think my influence is the work of Intel. Uh, my life has been intertwined with Intel. Uh, my work at Intel has been the defi defining activity of my life over actually more than the last 25 years, more like 35. Uh, and Intel in turn has been a participant in the digital revolution that is sweeping the world, has swept the world in the last 25 years and is going to be probably this unifying story of technology and social change over the next 25 years. Mr. Grove, as you look back on your career, what is your proudest accomplishment? My proudest accomplishment is that I contributed to the creation of a company that has survived generations of technology change, has created the mechanism with which personal computing has shipped half a billion or maybe closer to a billion personal computers to and put it in people's hands and has been the basis with which the internet has developed and is developing to be the communication mechanism of our lifetime. A lot of people start a business with the idea of being successful, then cashing out and starting something new. You could have left Intel a long time ago, but you didn't. What keeps you going? Intel is like a river. It changes every day, and behind every bend, there is a new vista and a new challenge. I cannot think of any place where I would rather have worked, or rather would work today, that would provide as much intellectual challenge, as much uh, enjoyment of working with people who are dedicated to the same cause and pulling together. Uh, nothing has attracted me any more than Intel has. In your years at Intel, you talked about paranoia as a strength in dealing with furious competition. And in fact, your book, that you titled it, Only the Paranoid Survive. How did you turn paranoia into a strength? You know, paranoia is a catchphrase that encapsulates awareness that the more successful you are, the more people are stimulated by your success and try to knock you off your pedestal. And time of responsiveness, being able to anticipate the, their moves in time so that you can prevent them from achieving their objective by getting ahead is really the most important advantage that you can develop in this seesaw of competitive battle. What do you see as your biggest failure, and what did you learn from it? I was asleep when the personal computer came onto the scene for some period of time. I did not appreciate the explosive strength that it, was, it had as a market for our product and the potential acceptance that it was going to have in the world. And consequently, we left unused a variety of techn technological developments and products that we could have deployed, including the software area, and been even more important and more successful in the early years of personal computing. Mr. Grove, if you were going to start a new business today, what would it be? Yeah, I don't know what the business would be, but uh, the field would be in biotechnology and the application of computer science to medical problems. I think that field is in the <clears throat> early stages of development, sort of akin to the personal computer revolution 25 years ago. Okay 
and it is likely to have similar transformative powers on our lives and on the lives of the next generations of people. Speaking of the next generation, the next generation of entrepreneurs, what piece of advice, one important piece of advice can you give them? Don't fall in love with being an entrepreneur. Fall in love with the product, fall in love with the technology. That's great advice. Mr. Grove, thank you very much for your time and congratulations. Thank you. We also caught up with some of the other distinguished personalities on our list. One was John Bogle, the founder of Vanguard Investments and the man who single-handedly revolutionized the mutual fund business. Linda O'Brien asked Bogle what he considered to be his greatest challenge. Well, I guess I'd have to say getting fired from a job that, with a company that I thought was mine, although I didn't own it, in 1974 was certainly the biggest challenge I've had in my business career so, by far. So tell us what happened after you got fired. Well, first I didn't like it much. Uh, I was heartbroken. Uh, my career was really in shambles and I had to figure out what to do about it. And what came into my mind was an idea I'd had probably going back to when I wrote my senior thesis at Princeton on the mutual fund industry and that is that the structure of the mutual fund industry could be improved on. Uh, we needed to do something new and being fired gave me an opportunity to walk down a new road. And you walked down that new road the very next day. With the a very next, it is a, a curious coincidence of the calendar that the uh, board meeting of Wellington Management Company, the, fund, the organization that fired me was on uh, I think Monday evening and the board meeting of the fund directors, a slightly different group, was in New York uh, on the very next day. So after getting fired at 2 o'clock in the morning, I was on the, the uh, 7 o'clock train to New York the next morning trying to make my case. What was your vision at that point for, for the company? Yeah, my, my vision was to create a mutual fund company that was organized not for the managers to make money by operating a company and having a big profit after they take their expenses. Mutual fund managers get fees, they deduct their costs, and they make an extraordinarily large amount of money. My, uh, my idea was to have the management company owned by the funds themselves, a truly mutual mutual fund group uh, in which all those profits would be basically rebated to the fund shareholders, and that's the way it's worked. How did you talk the board into running a new fund which uh, ultimately became the Standard & Poor's 500 Index Fund? Well, my first idea was an idea I'd also been playing with for decades, really, and that is the idea of a market index fund, a fund that would own the entire stock market, through the Standard & Poor's 500, about the same thing, and just uh, uh, not manage anything. And of course, when I proposed this new fund, uh, the directors said, you're not allowed to get into investment management. And I said, well, this fund isn't managed. And they bought that somewhat disingenuous argument. You have also endured medical challenges, having undergone a successful heart transplant. Uh, but, <laughs> but you said you had some serious reservations bef before accepting that heart transplant. What were they? Well, I mean, obviously I wanted to live. I had my first heart attack with, when I was 30 years old and was, had struggled with it for 35 years. And by the time um, my heart was about to give out at age 66, actually, uh, I was, tried to find a heart transplant uh, and uh, was taken into the heart transplant system in which you're basically dated when you get in there, there's no favoritism. Uh, you get in line and wait, and I waited for 128 days to get that transplant being kept alive on intravenous. But during that time, I started to think pretty seriously about uh, you know, whether an old guy, if you will, should get a heart destined for a younger person. And uh, I finally decided that the system was the system, and uh, maybe I could be some use as a citizen and as a human being to the world. So I decided I would take advantage of that huge break that was offered to me. So from your personal challenges, what lessons would you have for today's leaders? If, if, if my life can offer any lesson to, any, to anybody, let's be fair, is never underestimate the importance of determination and never underestimate the, the importance of values and never underestimate the importance of some kind of virtue as you run your career. Try and do things better. Uh, I think a good rule for every leader is let's try and leave whatever we touch a little bit better than it was when we found it. And uh, a few other lessons that are in my career that we haven't talked about really are if you make a mistake, admit it. Uh, if you want to be bold, and boldness is a very important part of leadership, have some foresight. Don't be bold for the wrong things. 
uh, try and figure out what the right way to do things is, and then be bold. Uh, and another, another trait I think is important is introspection. You know, walk around yourself once in a while, laugh at yourself, ask yourself whether you're really as smart as you think you are, or as, or as uh, determined as you think you are, or anything else. Uh, don't give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Uh, give yourself the question of doubt. Great suggestions. Thank you very much, John Bogle. Thank you. Another of the 25 most influential who agreed to be interviewed was William George, the former CEO and chairman of Medtronic. Linda O'Brien began by asking what he considered to be the greatest challenge of his 30-year career. Well, I recall the uh, spring of 1998. I'd been CEO for seven years, and going back to my predecessor, Medtronic had had a string of very rapid growth in the range of 18% plus every year for 13 years. But I realized the growth was really slowing down, and we had some new products coming, but they were a year or so away from approval by the FDA. We had one major business losing about $50 million, and we just didn't have the growth that we'd had for so long. So a successful company, but you needed to move forward. Well, we need to move forward, but the growth is coming to an end. And a lot of our executive team had really losing confidence that we could keep it going. And a lot of them wanted to say, let's just have a bad year. Several people suggested we shouldn't do any more acquisitions because we had not done well with some of the smaller acquisitions we had uh, uh, acquired uh, three, four years before. In the end, then, how did you overcome those kinds of challenges? Well, we had a board meeting we scheduled in Switzerland. It was really to look at our European business, but we used it to spend a whole day with our board talking about the alternatives and finally got the board support to go forward with putting acquisitions on the table that they could consider. And we went out and made a series of five acquisitions in the space of the next five months, uh, spent uh, $9 billion on those acquisitions, and it actually literally transformed the company. Uh, we were very lucky that they all fell into place, and uh, some of the executive committee members were rather disgruntled that we'd gone ahead without their support, but I just felt it was the right thing to do at that time. So when you can't hit the numbers, what do you do? <laughs> well, you can do one, one or two things. You can uh, kind of hedge the accounting, which we chose not to do, or you can get, uh, uh, get on the phone with all your investors, in this case about 350 of them, security analysts, and say, let's face it, we're not going to make the numbers. We stand behind this acquisition and the other four acquisitions we did. We think they'll be great strategic for this company but we're going to have one quarter we don't make the numbers. And I did that, and boy, did I get blasted from all sides. People called me a liar. You didn't tell us the truth. You knew you weren't going to do well. And I said, look, folks, I'm not clairvoyant. I can't always see the future. There's big risk in business, but I can tell you, this is the right thing to do. You have been described as the unofficial spokesperson <laughs> for responsible leadership. How did you end up with that description? Well, it's a nice description, but all I can say is not many people spoke out against the bad things that were going on in business over the last several years, and I felt obliged to do that because we're setting a terrible role model for our young leaders coming along. Uh, far too many leaders hedge the numbers, not just the people that did illegal things, but people that uh, let their companies go downhill because they wouldn't face tough issues and they wouldn't stand in there and just say, look, we're not going to make the numbers, so we're going to have to make some changes. And you have said we need new leaders, not just new laws, to get us out of this corporate uh, crisis that has seen the likes of Enron, Tyco, and WorldCom. How do you see today's new leaders? Well, the good news is I think we have some very authentic leaders stepping up and taking over companies, ones that aren't as concerned with facing uh, the outside world and more concerned with their customers, their employees, and getting back to doing the right kind of business. And yet there is enormous pressure from Wall Street for performance. That pressure has not been reduced one bit. If anything, it's worse. I think it's far too much on short-term performance. That doesn't tell the tale. What tells the tale, can you build your business over the long term, not the short-term numbers? Do you make the expectations for the quarter? What really determines the success of a company is do you have the right strategy going forward? Do you have the long-term view? And are you prepared to get there and do whatever it takes and build the team of people around you that have to uh, uh, make it happen? You mentioned the team, and we hear a lot about teams in corporate America. But you also contend that leaders really need the courage and confidence of their own decisions. How do you reconcile the two? Well, my style was always to listen to the inputs from everyone, but in the end you have to kind of withdraw, look inside yourself and say, what's the right thing to do? And it's too easy to get buffeted by all those outside forces of this investor wanting you to do that or this team member wanting you to do something else. You really have to decide in the end what's the right thing to do. And I think great decisions uh, require that uh, inward looking reflective approach and then you go forward and ask everyone to be with you. 
Then from your personal challenges, what are the lessons learned that might help the next generation of leaders? Uh, first of all, focus on your customers and your employees, not on the outsiders who are telling you what to do. Second of all, build a strong team around you and get them committed to go with you. And third, uh, when it comes to big decisions, look inside yourself and make the right decision uh, for you and have the courage to take uh, the, the road less traveled and make that decision to make your company, enable your company to go forward. Thank you very much. We've been speaking with William George, former CEO of Medtronic. Quite inspiring, Susie. Yes, it is, Paul. It's been an exciting 25 years for Nightly Business Report. And we're looking forward to the next 25. I'm Susie Garrow. Thanks for watching. And I'm Paul Kangas, wishing all of you the best of goodbyes.